Join my film crew and I as we travel across the world to seek the truth behind what we know about one of the deadliest makeup ingredients dating back hundreds of years. Was lead really a part in slowly poisoning people, including royalty? Did Queen Elizabeth I really have heavy white makeup loaded with lead, like the paintings and movies have made us believe? What we unravel might just blow your mind and change history. I'm Erin Parsons, and this is Killer Cosmetics, The Lead Series. This is Queen Elizabeth I as she was seen on her coronation day in 1558, later known as the Virgin Queen. She has long auburn hair, cheeks and lips subtly rouged, and skin so fair, so translucent, that her veins peek through at the temples. Then in 1562, only a few years after she was crowned, at 29 years of age, Queen Elizabeth would suffer a catastrophic, often deadly and disfiguring disease, smallpox. If you've never seen what smallpox actually looked like, I'm gonna warn you now, you may want to look away. I'm gonna share with you actual footage of what the variola virus looked like at the peak of its terror. Its symptoms included aches, nausea, high fever, a blistering rash containing pus. And it first appears on the face, then it would move to the hands and the feet, and finally the whole body. The pustules would eventually scab over and unfortunately leave scars on the skin. And now a word from our sponsors. That is honestly quite dramatic. I think Queen Elizabeth could have used today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Guys, it's 2024, it's a new year, and you may have some goals that you want to achieve. My personal goal was to bring you the highest quality content. However, with that comes a little bit of stress management, and that is where therapy comes in for me, among many other reasons. If you are looking to achieve your goals, maybe you want a new job. It's something more emotional, like less anger in a conflict. For me, having a therapist helps me put my best self forward, and that helps me create great content, which might be therapy for you. If you're interested in talking to a therapist, BetterHelp makes starting therapy so much easier and less intimidating for most people. And you can save 10% using this link. BetterHelp can match you to one of over 30,000 therapists in their network. To get started, you just fill out a questionnaire. They're gonna ask you a few questions that pertains to what challenges you have, and then they'll match you with a therapist that is perfect for you. For me personally, I'm a homebody and it's cold outside, so I love that I can just literally call my therapist. If you do not feel that your therapist is a great fit, it's very easy to change by the click of a button and at no additional cost. Join over 4 million people who have use BetterHelp to have a healthier and happier life. Click the link in my description or use betterhelp.com forward slash Aaron Parsons. It's going to save you 10% off your first month and BetterHelp can connect you with a therapist that can help you. And thank you again, BetterHelp, for sponsoring today's video. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. It's no wonder after this that Queen Elizabeth would begin to use a heavy white toxic lead makeup, a cosmetic that would further destroy her skin, cause it to become gray and wrinkled, eating away at her flesh and eventually leading to her demise in 1603. Or is this what Hollywood would have you believe? Now, smallpox scars are not. I find it hard to believe that any human, especially a queen who was judged by her every move, would walk around looking like a goddamn clown. In the 1970s, art historian Sir Roy Strong coined the term the mask of youth. This was a way to describe Queen Elizabeth's appearance in portraits in the latter years of her reign. Now what started this whole entire search for me is this video. I think it's absolutely fascinating the way in which um, Elizabeth, that term the mask of youth, has actually defined the way in which Elizabeth was portrayed on film and in drama. In the 1930s, um, Flora Robson portrayed um, Elizabeth I twice and there isn't a trace of the thick white makeup that you see post-1970 after Sir Roy Strong has coined this term, the mask of youth. To expand on what she said, if Hollywood's portrayal before the 1970s looked like this, then after the mask of youth was coined, we see this. Have we been duped? If you would lay eyes upon me now, you would not recognize me. Has this whole thing about the queen wearing this heavy white paint just been a Hollywood myth? 
I want the truth. And to cover up these scars, she used a white lead-based makeup. She didn't know what to do, so she started covering it in like this white makeup. The makeup she used was called Venetian Cherise. It was highly toxic. Her face was as white as like any clown. Help me. So I went searching. I flew to London to visit the National Portrait Gallery because I wanted to see these images up close. but it's not like an overly painted face. It doesn't look like makeup. But if you compare this picture, which the mask of youth, keep in mind, to this one, she definitely looks older in this portrait, but also it's almost cartoon-like. I can see why she would prefer Nicholas Hillier because he made her look more realistic. I don't think it was just that he made her young, although she definitely looks fresher in that portrait versus here. You can see the gray skin, you can see the wrinkles, and it almost does feel like she's wearing makeup in this portrait. This is the Phoenix portrait. Now, I believe she was around 60 years old here. There's definitely the mask of youth. She does look younger than maybe 60 years. She looks extremely white in this photo. It seems that when they restored this particular portrait, there was a varnish over top that actually kind of yellowed the painting. It made it look much softer. And when they restored it, they brought back all of the whiteness. So again, makes me question, was she actually painted this intensely white? Now, if I compare these portraits to that of an actress from the 1600s, this is Nell Gwynn. And when you look at her, this looks like makeup and actors and actresses back then on the stage and theater, they were known to use cosmetics. So when you see these pictures next to each other, I think it's quite apparent. One looks more natural and one looks completely made up by the use of cosmetics. Next, I looked at her wax effigy. This technically would have been made out of wood at the time that she died. They would have put this on top of her coffin and the crowds, when they saw this, they gasped because it looked so real and so so much like her that they felt she was still alive. And that's a really important part to this story because I don't see makeup in this wax effigy. There's no heavy white paint. Actually, it's not an exaggerated white makeup. It just looks like a skin tone, but it's remarkably similar to the tomb downstairs. So is this what she actually looked like? I see no mask of youth here. She looks like an older woman and there's no heavy white paint. If this was made back then, why would they not exaggerate the heavy white paint that we've come to know about Queen Elizabeth I? When I'm looking at this wax effigy, it's a very good representation of what she physically looked like. And if you compare the wax effigy to her actual tomb, it looks like a human being with a prominent nose, which she was described as. I don't see, obviously, any kind of heavy white paint, which if that was such a part of her character, why don't we see it? While I was in London, I visited beauty historian Lucy Jane Santos. Now, her specialty is toxic cosmetics. She literally wrote the book on radium in beauty. I asked Lucy, was there any proof of her actual use of cosmetics? There is no contemporary evidence that she would ever wore that thick white paste. One unreliable testimony that dates back uh, to late 1600. Is it the Jesuit priest? Yes, Father Rivers. To paraphrase what he says, he says that um, by all accounts, she's been seen in recent times wearing thick makeup, that an inch thick at some points, and she wears it all over her chest and her face. He's not a good witness. I mean, for a start, he didn't actually see it himself. He's referring to somebody else, uh, you know, so he says, by all accounts, this is what she looks like. He's also a Catholic um, in hiding, and this is the time when Catholics are being persecuted in England by Elizabeth I and her court. He's not very... Uh, he hates her. Yes, he's not really... <laughs> 
minded to be saying nice things to her, or nice things about her, rather. So Father Rivers was a Jesuit priest, which means he was Catholic. So he was basically in hiding. He would have never even seen her. He wouldn't have gotten close to her. This can't really be believed. But this quote is important though. It gives some hint that maybe makeup was used, but then he talks about cloths in her cheeks in order to like fill them out. Her face showeth some decay, which to conceal when she cometh in public, she putteth many fine cloths into her mouth to bear out her cheeks. So cheek poppers were found back in the day. They were made of cork, so it's not completely unheard of. The whole thing just seems like catty, and obviously he hates her, so why would he say anything nice about her? I think if she was painted like a clown, there would be more written about her than this one disparaging account from someone who never even actually saw her. In this book, The Queen's Bed, the author claims that Queen Elizabeth would have used mercury supplement or a liquid pearl to give a translucent glow and create that ivory complexion. She also claims that she used lead carbonate on the skin mixed with lead hydroxide. So if the theory is that she wore actual lead makeup, I need to see what lead cosmetics actually looked like in person. So I flew to Canada to meet Professor and Dr. Fiona McNeil at McMaster's University. She has studied the effects of lead poisoning for over 30 years and is the only person I've ever known to do experiments using lead cosmetics. Finally, I get to see what lead makeup actually looks like up close. So welcome to the Toxic Allure Lab. So this is a biosafety cabinet. We have our pig skin. We get this from a local butcher. So ethically sourced, because the rest of the pig was going to be eaten. I'm so blown away. This is the first time I've ever seen lead makeup. We have loaded the makeup into these syringes. Boston 1833. There are some lead recipes that exist in history, but so few, and the ones that do exist have zero measurements. Now, Professor McNeil has actually experimented with all of the formulas. There's probably five of them out there. And this particular one is from the 1830s. Not only did it have all the ingredients listed, but it also has the exact measurements. So she's using something that would have been used from the past. And this particular formula, which she's titled Boston 1833, actually goes back to the 1700s. So this is the first time in modern history that we will see what lead makeup actually looks like on the skin. It's maybe a little cold, so it'll take me a little bit to work it in. When they were putting on their cells, I'm convinced they must have rubbed it between their fingers first because it's quite hard and waxy. Mm. And I, I think it would take a bit of softening before you could actually work it into the skin. So if you look at the bare skin and you look at the, mm -hmm. with the white light on it, mm -hmm. it's, it's acting more like a blurring content. To me, it looks a little bit like it's like a softening, like you said, a blurring effect. Lightly illuminating, you can see a brighter pink skin versus the bare. Yeah. And also almost as if it's filling in some of the texture. What we do see when we use the, the spectroscopy is, is, you're exactly right, it's acting much more like uh, one of these illuminators that we buy now. I'm absolutely shocked. I was expecting it to be a heavy white paint, and it's not. It, it doesn't look like makeup. No, it, it's lovely. It's a lovely soft glow. And it's I, soft glow. And, and we were shocked the first time we saw it too. And I, I've, I've often said, if it, if it wasn't dangerous, I'd wear it. You know I would have been wearing lead back yeah. in the day. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> and you know, when you're, when you're my age, you can do with all the soft focus you can get. Unless you were in the know, you probably wouldn't have realized we were wearing makeup. Everything that we have thought about lead makeup is actually wrong. Oh yeah, I now consider that white mask to be a complete and utter myth. It's not what it looked like at all. Two layers of lead makeup on that pig skin. It gave a brightening effect. It gave some luminosity to the skin. It didn't look white. I asked her if any of these concoctions of lead makeup could produce a very heavy white paint, and she said none of them. Do any of the formulas look heavy and white? No, none of them. None of the formulas that we have tested look heavy and white. None. I was shocked. If she did use any makeup at all, I believe it was quite subtle. So we saw it on the pig skin. It looked smoother. It looked illuminated. It looked brighter and somewhat whiter as it toned down the redness. But could it actually fill in pores? Could it smooth out fine lines and wrinkles? I guess there's only one way to find out. In part two, we're going to actually make lead makeup. 
I have some final thoughts. Lucy had mentioned how some of these accounts of Queen Elizabeth wearing makeup actually came long after her death, and it was rooted in sexism. There's the one that we know, there's the one that we see in, in theater, we see in film, and we see on TV mm -hmm. today. That's not what she would look like. That's our modern day interpretation. And a lot of that's actually rooted unbelievably in Victorian sexism. So we start seeing these descriptions of her in the 19th century as being old, wizened, with a thick white makeup, black teeth. And actually, when you really look into it, she wasn't described like that before. So we start seeing these really mean descriptions of her, and it's all rooted in, in sexism. This is the 19th century, women are getting more power, and there's a lot of old men writers who really fear this new female emancipation. I think she gets a bad rap, and I feel it's unfair and it's sexist. She went through a lot, okay? Her mother was killed when she was three. Her father basically had nothing to do with her. Her sister died. Her brother died. She never married. She never had children. When she was eight years old, after seeing another of Henry's wives murdered, she remarked to her schoolmate, I shall never marry. And I think she saw a lot of women die in childbirth. I think it's part of the reason she never wanted to marry. She was probably pretty damn traumatized. By the time she became queen, she had to constantly prove herself because she was a woman. I know. I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too! Yet all people can talk about is her love life, her black teeth, and her painted face. It's baloney. In part two, not only are we going to make a lead makeup, but we're going to find out how toxic it really was. And I might even try it on.